here we go. And Travis, we have Travis Knutson here from El Rapa, who's going to talk to us about air quality tonight. Are you ready for us, Travis? Uh, yes, I am. Thanks, Jackie. And uh, hello, everybody. Again, my name is Travis Knutson. I'm the Public Affairs Manager for the Lane Regional Air Protection Agency. Um, El Rapa is the local uh, regulatory authority responsible for monitoring and uh, essentially protecting the air quality through different programs we have, which I will get into once I start my presentation here. Um, give me a second to hit this guy and share my screen. Bear with me and see if I can zoom open here. Okay, so and slide one. See my slide? Am I good to go? Yep. Yes. Yep. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody, again. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is Travis Knutson, the Public Affairs Manager for the Lane Regional Air Protection Agency, and I appreciate being invited here tonight to talk about air quality specific to wildfires and resources that exist so you can uh, see what the air quality is in your neighborhood and learn what actions you might be able to take to reduce your exposure to um, wildfire smoke, which is an important thing to do uh, as wildfire seasons driven by climate change is becoming a broader problem across the Pacific Northwest with our wildfire season starting earlier, lasting longer, and also being more intense at times. I'm sure all of us remember last year, which was a rough year, especially for those a little bit farther to the um, eastern portions of the Willamette Valley up in Oak Ridge, for example, had a rough 2021 wildfire season. And then locally here in the Eugene Springfield area, uh, 2020 was a really rough year with the worst air quality we have seen. Um, so first, I want to start off by just explaining a little bit more about what El Rapa is, uh, the El Rapa 101, which we are the local government agency. Um, we essentially monitor air quality in Lane County, and we have different programs uh, that we administer to protect and maintain air quality throughout Lane County. Uh, we're a little unique in that we're the only countywide air quality regulatory agency in the state of Oregon. If you go outside Lane County, uh, the government authority responsible for maintaining air quality is actually the state government, the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality. El Rapa is pretty old. We were founded in 1968. We actually predate uh, DEQ. Um, and uh, local government allows for more interaction with uh, the locals here and uh, more local control over uh, air quality programs um, that you can kind of see here on the screen. So we monitor for what's called criteria pollutants and air toxic pollutants. And those are different types of air pollution that can be seen. Uh, criteria pollutants is sort of a six different classes of pollution pollutants um, that we can see in Lane County or anywhere. And then air toxics is a much more diverse, different types of um, uh, air pollution. And we monitor for both of those. We implement air quality strategies such as a green, yellow, red Homewood heating advisory day for Eugene, Springfield and Oak Ridge. This is much more common in the winter time when we see air inversions that can be common here in the Willamette Valley. Uh, wood smoke from wood stoves, which is still a common way that people heat their homes um, that can create air quality problems when we have those inversions, especially when wood stoves are being used in ways that are inefficient and create more smoke than uh, what is necessary. And that smoke can collect the bottom of the valley and can really have a big impact on our air quality. So we will uh, set what days are going to be green, yellow, or red. Yellow being a day where we request people to voluntarily not use their wood stoves. And then red is when those wood stove use is prohibited. We do have an exemption program for those who have a wood stove as their singular source of heat, as well as low income exemptions for that program. We also determine days when outdoor burning is allowed in Lane County. Outdoor burning, for those who aren't familiar, is more common in rural areas. It is not allowed within the Eugene city limits. Um, but it's essentially all the yard debris that grows all winter long managing that yard debris. Um, people with larger properties like to burn it as a way to dispose of it, which is useful from a um, fire defense perspective to um, help to shield your property from wildfires. Uh, and is something that we will say what days that can and cannot occur. We look for essentially is the uh, air quality or the weather forecast supporting that smoke to just rise into the air, 
or is it a day when that smoke would be settled right at the surface of the earth where it can degrade air quality and bother neighbors? Um, on those days, that's when we will not allow outdoor burning to take place during burn season. Uh, another program that we do, which is really, this is kind of a big part of what El Rapa does, is we issue air permits to commercial and industrial businesses in Lane County who emit air pollution above a certain level. So we get with that business, we understand what their processes are and what they will be doing. And then we look to our rules, both local, state, and federal rules, um, and provide permit conditions to those facilities saying what they can and cannot do um, to make sure that they are following the rules uh, countywide, statewide, and on a federal level. And then we also receive and investigate air quality complaints from the community, uh, which can be, you know, if you have a, an experience of a neighbor who has a homewood heating device and they're creating a lot of smoke and it's bothering you, will receive that complaint and reach out to that neighbor and begin with some education to show them ways that they can use their wood stove um, to create less smoke. And then we have the ability to issue um, fines if those issues continue and the education is not helpful. We also receive air quality complaints on industrial sources, uh, which is a database that we maintain to sort of each industry or business has a tally of air quality complaints that can accumulate over time. And we use that as a metric to determine what facilities might be considered a nuisance uh, to the community. We can approach the facility and uh, begin a conversation about making changes to uh, make them less so of a nuisance to neighbors. And then of course we inform and educate uh, the public on air quality issues in the county, such as coming to groups like this and having a conversation about air quality resources, particularly as it pertains to wildfires. So monitoring is a big part of what we do. So I'm gonna go through some of the monitoring that we have. Um, we have eight regulatory or government grade monitors. This is one of the older guys that's actually been discontinued in 2022. The federal government, the EPA um, is phasing this one out, but uh, this is a gravimetric sampler, which we're still using a little bit by the end of the year, will no longer be a method that we um, use to monitor the air. But you can see the filter there on your screen is essentially we have air that it gets pushed through this filter and then the filter is weighed. And depending on um, how much that filter weighs after it's been had some air move through it, we're able to determine what the air quality is. Um, another sampler that we use is called a beta attenuation sampler. And this essentially has a very minor amount of beta radiation that will sort of pass through a, um, uh, a film that has particles collected onto this film. And depending on how much that radiation, we have a kind of a Geiger counter essentially, um, how much it's able to detect of that beta radiation is able to determine how much of that radiation has been blocked by particles. And that is how we're able to measure air quality um, in one of those methods. And then another method we use is called a nephlometer. This one's a little bit more affordable, but it's still kind of an expensive device at about $17,000. And this uses a laser light essentially, and it'll shine a laser light across a small box. And depending on how much that laser light will deflect or be redirected um, is how it's able to count how many particles are in the air. Um, and from that, we're able to determine what the air quality is. So those um, monitors are the eight different ambient air quality monitoring that we have. And we have eight stations throughout Lane County that use one or the other forms of uh, monitoring. So you can see here on the map, this is Lane County. And that's about where all of our monitoring stations are. Some stations are only used temporarily for certain parts of the year, such as Saginaw, which is where we measure for ozone. And ozone is really a summertime issue because ozone is created when we have volatile VOCs or volatile organic compounds, which mix with heat and sunlight and that can create ozone. So that's really an issue that we see in the summer more so than the winter. So May 1st is when ozone season begins and we'll have that monitor up and running um, out in Saginaw to measure for that. And then there's another form of air monitoring that we use, and this is called a purple air sensor. It's a commercial grade sensor and it's um, about the size of your fist as you can see in the uh, pictures there. This form of monitoring is significantly more affordable, about 250 so dollars a piece. It's not accurate enough to be considered a government grade monitor. So the information from these monitors cannot be used from a regulatory perspective. So we can't 
put up a purple air sensor and then measure the air and then turn to the EPA or the federal government and say, look, our air quality is great. Um, they don't think that counts. They want some devices that are a little bit more precise um, for actually determining what our air quality is to show that we're meeting standards that the EPA sets. However, from a informational perspective, um, so that way people in Lane County to have an understanding of about what the air quality is, these are great little devices. Um, commercial air monitors have become significantly more popular over the last few years and not many of them, but plenty of them uh, are almost magic number generators. Uh, they don't necessarily do what they claim to do, um, but the purple air sensor is one of the ones that actually has turned out to be very precise. And because of that, it sort of has exploded in popularity across the globe um, with purple airs being installed in many locations. So what you see here on your screen is a big graph, but I'll kind of explain it or go through it. Um, the graph on your right, essentially that is uh, a measure of the precision of the purple air sensor. So that dotted blue line is kind of what we would expect the uh, purple air sensor to be able to detect or, or what we would expect the purple air sensor to read. And the big blue dots is what the purple air sensor has shown in testing trials. And so it follows that line pretty well, which means it's very precise. Um, which was a good thing because some of those commercial grade air monitors sometimes aren't as good on the precision side of things. Um, the graph you see on your right hand side, that is, we did a, a study where we took our a purple air sensor and we compared it to the nephlometer, one of the more expensive uh, monitors. So the purple line is the purple air and the red line is the nephlometer. And you can see there's a little bit of some variation. The purple airs tends to be reading a little bit high in general. And because of that, the data has to be massaged a little bit. It has to have a correction factor that's applied to it. But a correction factor has been made. And when you apply that correction factor to the data, um, it really is a great device. And you can see that the purple air is as precise as the red line, um, but it's pretty close. So from an informational perspective, from just knowing is the air quality okay enough outside or is it bad enough that maybe I need to do something to lower my exposure, um, it's a great device for determining that information. And so because of that, El Rapa has been slowly installing purple airs across Lane County. We've actually installed about 90 of them, over 90 of them throughout Lane County. So the that, picture you see on your screen, of course, is Lane County with all the purple air monitors. And then this box is zoomed in a little bit more. Not all of these purple air sensors that you see are El Rapa sensors. People do purchase their own purple air sensors because they're commercially available to anybody. Um, so what you see on here is also from people who um, just bought their own and put it in. One of the things that has been found with purple air sensors is generally it's neighborhoods and community groups that have more disposable income available to them where these purple air sensors tend to be installed as where lower income parts of the, the neighborhoods or lower income neighborhoods won't often see as many purple air sensors. And that was something that El Rapa has seen um, in other communities. And so we take effort to try to expand our purple air network um, all across the area to avoid that inequity issue. So that way all neighborhoods in the Eugene Springfield region or Lane County in general um, have access to information of what the air quality is outside. And accessing this information is a really important thing to do. And we'll get into in just a little bit on why that's the case. Um, but the best place to find out what the air quality is for you is this website right here. It's fire.airnow.gov. And this is uh, what that website looks like. And you can see those purple air sensors throughout the Eugene Springfield area. What's special about this site is that it uses both um, purple air sensors and the FRM monitors, which is essentially those really expensive government grade monitors. So if you look on that map, you'll notice a lot of squares. The squares are all the purple air sensors, the commercial grade sensors, as where the circles are the government grade sensors. So the one that's off of Highway 99 there, the one that's to the north in the River Road area, and the one in Springfield, those are uh, three of El Rapa's monitors that we have um, here. And this fire.airnow.gov website, this is called the Fire and Smoke Map. It's an EPA website. 
This will also show wildfires that are associated or and the smoke that's associated with the wildfire. So from a wildfire uh, information perspective, this website is great. Um, something you can do on this website is any of those little sensors you see, the square ones or the circle ones, you can click on it and it will pull up a little bit more information for you. It'll tell you what the air quality is on the air quality index, which I'll get into describing that a little bit more detailed here in a second. It'll tell you a lot of other great information, such as the trend. Is the air quality holding steady? Is it decreasing? Is it improving? What is it doing? Um, and it'll provide you with recommendations, which in here in the, the example that I have, it was reported as good. So the recommendation is that it's a great time to open the doors and windows to go outside, and there's really no uh, reason for any kind of alarm or concern. It has a graph that'll go back a few days and it'll show you what the air quality has done over the last couple of days for that sensor, which can be useful as well because in instances like winter time, when we have uh, inversions that can take place at night and we have lots of wood stove use being seen in a community, you can see air quality diminish during the night. But then when the sun comes up and we start to see temperatures warm, that inversion breaks and then the air quality improves. And people don't see it because the smoke or the poor air quality was really only present at night. So the graph is helpful in um, um, catching some of those trends that occur. And while the fire.airnow.gov website is great for using on the computers, we're pretty much mobile people at this point in time. We all have our phones and most of our information that we access is through our phones. So there is an app that the EPA has created. It's the AirNow app. Um, and if you download that app, it's available on iPhones as well as Android phones, you can essentially see that map that I was just showing you with all of that information. Um, the screen grab I have here on the iPhone that was taken during uh, the 2020 wildfires where you can see there's a few more colors on the map. Um, but that's great information to have available to see what the air quality is in your local neighborhood. So the question is, why is this something that we should pay attention to? Why should we be checking the air quality, whether it's wildfire season or not? And that's because of the health impacts of PM25 and PM10 pollution. So PM stands for particulate matter and the 2.5 and the 10, those numbers just designate how big, or I guess I should say how small that particular particle is. So a PM10 is a particle that is smaller than 10 micrograms. As you can see on the graphic here that a human hair is about 50 to 70 micrograms. So PM10 is pretty small being a, that it's 10 micrograms or less. Um, PM25 is even smaller than that. So it's 2.5 micrograms or less. And this is important because um, I mentioned earlier how there's different types of air quality that we monitor for, whether it's a criteria pollutant or an air toxic pollutant. Uh, PM25 and PM10, these are criteria pollutants. And the criteria pollutants are generally uh, more harmful when it comes to human health. The air toxics, uh, hazardous air pollutants is another term for air toxics. Those can be harmful to human health as well. Uh, but the, the worst air pollution that um, we can really be breathing in is the PM24. PM25. Um, I work with closely with some people from the Oregon Health Authority, um, and they've talked about this a lot, but study after study, health study after health study shows that the worst pollution we can be exposed to is PM25. And the reason why that is, is because the PM25 particles are so small that when you inhale them, they will get really deep into your lungs and they will become entrapped in your lungs and they will never leave your lungs. And they're even so small that they can penetrate your lungs and get into your bloodstream and then accumulate elsewhere in your body. And that can create a lot of health problems. Um, the short term can be premature mortality. Um, we see increase in ER visits after PM25 exposure, an increase in hospitalization, um, both acute, so short term and chronic, which is long term bronchitis. And then the long-term health effects of exposure to PM25 and PM10 pollution, it can be premature death, seeing redu reduced lung function, lung cancer has been associated with it. And then the long-lasting health impacts are not quite fully understood. And this is an important point too, because with wildfire season, I think we can all agree that that's, that's now a thing that we expect. We, we have an expectation now that every summer for three, four, five days, there will be reduced air quality because of smoke from wildfires. 
And generally it's not too impactful if the air quality is poor and it's a little smoky outside. We may say, you know, it's, it's bad, but it's not that bad. I can still go for my walk in the evening or enjoy my life and, and go outside. And it, it, while it's uncomfortable or unpleasant, it's really not too bad. Um, but if you have that exposure for a couple days every summer over a lifetime and that PM25 pollution never leaves your lungs and it just continues to accumulate, that's where we can later in life really start to see some consequences from that exposure. So um, taking actions when uh, air quality does diminish to lower our exposure to PM2.5 is really important to protect our health um, in the future. And the biggest drivers of PM2.5 pollution in Lane County is from wildfire smoke, the worst air quality we've ever seen was in 2020 from the holiday farm fire and other fires in the state of Oregon. And then consistently our worst air quality is driven by wildfire smoke. The next source of PM2.5 pollution is actually from um, winter stagnation and wood stove use. People lighting fires um, in their stoves and creating more smoke than they would if they were lighting or using that wood stove as efficiently as they can. Other sources beyond that is from motor vehicles, particularly diesel engines create a lot of PM2.5 pollution. Um, and then industrial industry creates PM2.5 pollution, but industry PM2.5 pollution compared to even wood stove is significantly less. And a big part of the reason why is because El Rapa, through our air permits, when we get with a facility or a business, we can write rules that are very specific about how they need to be doing their operations and following all these strict regulations to make sure that they're creating as little PM 2.5 pollution as possible. But El Rapa doesn't go into people's homes and specifically state exactly how everybody should be using their wood stove and how they have to get the fire really hot and it has to be really small and there can't be any smoke coming out of the chimney. Um, because there's more flexibility there for residents, uh, wood stove uses uh, does create a significant source of PM2.5 pollution, particularly in the winter when we're seeing those inversions. So now that we know that PM2.5 is something that we need to think about, the next sort of step is understanding the air quality index, which is seen here on your screen. Some people may have seen this before, but it, it is a topic that not everybody's too familiar with, so I'll go through it. But what an air quality index is, is it's a scale between zero to 500. And there's no units on the scale, it's unitless. And the reason why it's unitless is because the air quality index accounts for many different types of air pollution, um, which have different units. Some of them can be micrograms per cubic meter, like we see with particulate matter. Other things can be parts per billion or parts per trillion. So they all have different units and it's hard to compare things that have different units. So um, to solve this problem, the EPA came up with the air quality index that has no units, uh, but there's a calculation that's done depending on the measurement of whatever the pollutant may be and where it falls in on the scale. Um, so the general guidelines is zero to 500 or zero to 50, excuse me, on the air quality index is good air quality. It means all is well, no action is needed and, and we can go about our days. When it gets to 51 to 100, that's moderate. And this is where sensitive groups should consider limiting their outdoor exertion. So going outside for a run or a really long walk or doing anything outdoors that would cause someone to breathe heavy. And so the next question comes up is well, what's a sensitive group? So a sensitive group is anyone with a heart or lung disease, um, older adults, uh, pregnant women and children and teenagers. Uh, these are groups that health studies have shown are more susceptible uh, or have more consequences from exposure to PM 2.5 and other pollutants. So those are what we consider to be sensitive groups. And the guidelines are different for sensitive groups than they are for just the general populace. When the air quality continues to get uh, degrade further, we get into the unhealthy for sensitive groups, which is orange, and that's 101 to 150. And this is where everyone should start to limit their prolonged outdoor exertions. So if you normally go on a walk in the evenings or you go for a run or whatever the case may be, or you have planned a whole bunch of yard work outside, um, maybe you should consider not doing that for too terribly long. And if you're a sensitive group, you should reduce your outdoor exposure. And so what that means is you should really limit how much time you're spending outside in general when air quality is at that level. The next level is 151 to 200, and this is unhealthy. 
And this is where everybody should really start considering limiting their outdoor exposure. So not spending any extra time outside, staying indoors with uh, windows closed and doors shut. Um, sensitive groups should really be avoiding outdoor exposure as much as possible. The next level is 201 to 300, which is purple. And that's where everybody should be avoiding outdoor exposure as much as possible. Going outside as little as you can, keeping the doors and windows closed um, and making sure your air quality indoors is as best as it can be, which we can talk about ways you can do that. And then when it gets to 301 to 500, which has only been seen in Lane County once, and that was, well, it's only been seen in the Eugene Springfield area, I should say once. And that was during the 2020 wildfires from the Holiday Farm Fire right around Labor Day. Last year, Oak Ridge West for saw some hazardous air conditions for a couple of days due to the, um, uh, uh, the wildfires uh, real close by. So there are, are ways to protect your health. Um, and the best way is to just follow those AQI guidelines to reduce or avoid exposure to poor air quality. Um, another thing you can do is to purchase or replace the home furnace in your air filter. So if you have a ductless uh, heating system in your home, uh, swapping that out, which is an easy chore to forget to do every three, depending on your filter really, but, but at most filters about every three months, you should be switching that out. And if you have a filter with MERV 13, um, that'll be uh, what will filter that PM 2.5 uh, pollution. Uh, another thing you can do is to use a HEPA air filter and air purifier in your home. They're starting to become more common, but you can find these HEPA air purifiers and filters at like Home Depot, Fred Meyer, I've seen them. Um, they're, people are realizing that they want to have some sort of indoor air filtration. So they're becoming more popular. So uh, retailers are supplying more of them, but right around wildfire season is when they become scarce. So this is kind of the time when everything's in stock to where you should consider doing that. Um, you can also do other things to create your own HEPA air purifier. For example, um, if you have one of those MERV 13 or higher air filters and you have a box fan, you can essentially um, take a, a bungee cord and bungee cord it to the box fan. And that too will work as a HEPA air filter. Um, sometimes those air purifiers can get really expensive and fancy because they have a whole bunch of buttons, but really all you need is just the air filter and you need air in your home moving through that filter. Um, the next thing you should do is to repair and replace drafty windows and unsealed doorways. Cause when the air quality outdoors gets bad, and if you have a drafty home, all of that outdoor air is going to go right inside and then there's no way to escape it. So assuring or doing what you can to make sure that your home has a seal on it um, is the best way to protect that indoor air quality. And when the indoor or the outdoor air is really bad, um, those are instances when you wanna even try limiting how often you open the door to go outside because every time that door opens, air comes in and that the air outside is really bad it's going to come inside and degrade your indoor air quality. Um, and then you also want to protect your indoor air quality by uh, changing practices that you may do using electrical appliances, not lighting candles. For my own home, uh, I have a gas stove, which I, I love my gas stove. I really like, like uh, cooking on my gas stove. I used to have an electric stove and it's fine, but the gas one is much better. But every time you try to light that stove and that, that gas that spills out before the flame lights it, or even just when it is lit and it's burning, that is emitting PM 2.5 pollution and indoor air quality can degrade really rapidly if you have a gas stove. Um, so a practice that I do is I turn on the fan in the kitchen when I'm lighting the stove. And then whenever I'm cooking on that stove, making sure that that fan is on to help pull that pollution, that PM 2.5, out of my kitchen to protect my indoor air quality. Um, and then of course you can follow El Rapa on social media or even news outlets. Uh, I, we have a pretty good relationship with KMTR, KVAL, um, KEZI, the Register Guard, KLCC. Um, and so when the air quality gets pretty bad, we let them know and they're pretty good at, at responding and, and sharing that information with everybody. Um, and uh, assuring that everyone at least is aware that air quality is degraded so that way people can take actions to um, protect themselves. So that's uh, the only rule uh, I wanted to share, at least in terms of wildfires and air quality. Um, one thing that I, I can do too, if there is a uh, interest is we can pull up the um, fire.airnow map and explore that a little bit more. Some of the screen grabs I have um, were from a while ago and uh, there's a lot more purple air sensors that are available in the community than what they were 
even in that screen grab. And of course, any questions too. Yeah, Erica, go ahead. Yeah, so I noticed like um, with the government um, air quality sensors, like uh, for Lane County, there's like almost nothing between Florence and Eugene Springfield. Um, and so I was just wondering, like, you know, I mean, I know there those areas aren't heavily populated, but I mean, still like is that an issue of like budget or Right. Yeah, it comes down to um, the resources and essentially the funding that's available to not just Arapa, but statewide. Uh, those monitors, the government grade monitors are uh, very expensive to not only set up, but then they take a staff to maintain and then to go out and get the data um, and pull the data in. So we put this, these monitors in places where the population is at, where it's at its greatest. So essentially you're getting the most uh, the most amount of benefit for the resources that are available for that. We have installed purple air sensors out um, into Venita. We installed one in Mapleton last year, and then we have a couple in Florence. We also have a government grade monitor in Florence to provide some of that informational um, benefit to those communities out there who don't have one of the regulatory monitors. Okay. Fred also had a question. Uh, <clears throat> some different information about backyard burning. I think it's the city of Eugene does not allow burning anywhere within the urban growth boundary where River Road is not city of Eugene, but we're within the urban growth boundary. So we're not supposed to have backyard fire pits, things like that. Yeah, so outdoor burning is the burning of that yardy uh, wood debris. Um, and that is in the city of Eugene and urban growth boundary of city of Eugene. That's not something that is permitted or allowed. The city of Eugene also has city code. It's like 0620, which is a, uh, a ban on residential, uh, like basically your recreational fire. So your fire pits, um, that's a city ordinance that Arapa doesn't enforce. So that's something that's up to the city to uh, enforce that rule. Um, but the city of Eugene does have a ban on recreational fire. And I think that that is more from a uh, concern for wildfire as opposed to an air quality concern, because generally the uh, recreational fires aren't burning enough wood to create an air quality problem, um, but accidents can happen and fires can be started, especially in some of the southern parts of the Eugene Springfield area or Eugene area. Um, so I think that's the source of that ordinance, but it is a city ordinance. Uh, Erica, you have your hand up? Yeah, I just had another question. And how do they enforce like the burning, like if it's prohibited? Um, I mean, how do they actually keep people from burning? Um, is there like, do they, I mean, obviously can't knock on everyone's door and say, hey, are you burning a wood stove or something? But how is that actually enforced? So we have a complaint, uh, basically it's a complaint program. So if someone sees or is bothered by a neighbor who has uh, excessive smoke coming out of their wood stove, they can file a complaint with El Rapa and we will begin first by sending a letter to that residence with some informational materials sort of describing ways you can use a wood stove to create less smoke from it because there are uh, approaches you can take such as having a smaller fire burning it hotter you can arrange the wood in a particular manner that will burn more efficiently and you can do things like not damping down on the fire so allowing a lot of airflow to it so we begin with that education um, to uh, let people know the actions they can take to make their fire more efficient and then if uh, smoke continues to be a concern, we follow up with visits and then do have the authority to place fines if needed, but that's kind of a last resort. And the same thing could be said for outdoor burning. Uh, Lane County is pretty big and we only have three compliance officers uh, who also respond to um, those complaints for homewood heating, outdoor burning complaints, and they're the same people responsible for inspecting industry in Lane County. Um, so they're very busy. So it's a complaint driven approach when it comes to outdoor burning as well. So if someone uh, is impacted by smoke generally, uh, they will let us know a complaint and then we can go out and check and see if any uh, rules are being violated, and then we can uh, take corrective actions. Okay, and also you should, um, have you looked into induction stoves? 
you're like pretty efficient at heating, um, you know, your food and, but they don't emit gas or anything like that. Because like, I just read an article recently about like, just like, you know, the gases are emitted through, uh, you know, through gas stoves and it's often higher than what they've been reported previously. So like, that's all in your home and you're breathing that in and it's also bad for the environment, so. Yeah, I know that there are newer technologies that, that kind of keep coming up to um, uh, take advantage of natural gas and minimize the amount of uh, PM 2.5 pollution that can be um, created. I'm not as familiar with those. Um, and indoor air quality isn't really something that Arapa uh, has too much information on because we're sort of outdoor air um, more than indoor air. But uh, I do know that gas stoves um, are one of the ways that indoor air quality can be degraded pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Just to add on to what Erica was saying, the uh, induction stoves use magnetism and they are basically instant on like gas. And what's really nice is that they're instant off. As soon as you turn them off, they're no longer hot. Hmm. So it's really cool technology. That is cool. Fairly spending right now though. <laughs> yeah. There's a norm in Spain though. Everyone had an induction stove when I was in Spain. It seemed like. All right, I see Kate's hand up next. I was wondering, Travis, if you could talk about the difference between El Rapa's authority for controlling outdoor burns versus uh, burns that are on agricultural land, because we have lots of ag, ag burns that go on in our neighborhood that are, some are, are horrible and they go on for days and we've complained to El Rapa, we've called the fire marshal, we've called, and they always say, oh, you have to talk to the Oregon Department of Agriculture, and then they don't have any I mean, other than guidelines about this is a good day to burn and this is not such a good day, they don't do any regulatory enforcement. Yeah, I um, I hear what you're saying and I know that you are not alone in that opinion. Uh, the way Oregon's law works is that uh, agriculture has, uh, there's kind of rights to farm laws and agricultural laws that um, sort of trump or precede El Rapa's authority. So when it comes to regulating agricultural burns, we have zero authority whatsoever. So in a hypothetical situation, if we went out to someone who's conducting an agricultural burn and we told them that they needed to put it out or do something differently, they could uh, and take it to court essentially and a judge would sort of throw it out because our authority um, doesn't exist any way, shape or form over um, agricultural burns. And that's at a state level where that uh, power structure aligns. Just wondering about some kind of, uh, I, I totally get the right to farm part. And as long as they can keep the effects of their uh, their practices on their property, I, I'm wholly for it. But where they're burning and making air unbreathable for hundreds and hundreds of people for days on end, it just seems like there's something missing in our regulatory authority to somehow have them pick days when they can, you know, it's not windy, there's no inversion, there's, there's not a reason that they have to burn all their filbert trimmings green, but they do. And so it's so smoky. I would, I would, and I've said this um, before to other people too, Kate, and this even applies, you know, to industrial complaints is um, there are times where El Rapa is limited in what we can do or the way that we can respond, be it to an industrial facility or to an agricultural burns, but letting El Rapa know that you are having this lived experience of being impacted by smoke, you know, acknowledging that we're limited in what we can do about it, but that sort of, it, we keep record of all air quality complaints that we receive. We have a database of it. And down the road, if the conversation comes up to be, you know, considering what might change from an agricultural perspective, having that database or having that record of here is a list of citizens who have been impacted this way um, by, you know, agriculture, whatever the case may be, that information can be very helpful and very useful. So I always recommend to someone when they have you know, and are impacted in air quality in any way, shape, or form, uh, letting us know. That doesn't mean that a RAPA necessarily can fix the problem, but we can write it down and save it in our database for historical purposes. And then in the future, if a conversation comes up where that information is relevant, 
um, we have it and then we can look to it and that can be a supporting point in whatever argument that's being made. So in, in your future, when you have that experience, file a complaint with us on our website. Um, know that we're limited in how we can respond or how we can resolve the situation, which is kind of none, um, but it is saved and we do keep that in our database. Um, and if you're, you and your neighbors and plenty of other people do that um, collectively, uh, that can show that there is a, an impacted community and that can be helpful in conversations in the future. I'm, I'm sorry if this has already been asked, but is it possible to get a copy of your uh, presentation? Uh, yeah, I yeah. sent it to Jackie and I think Jackie you probably can forward it to anybody who's here. Okay. Yeah, Judy. Yeah, we'll send that out with the meeting recording as well. And I can upload it on the YouTube link. Um, but I believe I have your email address. I can make sure you get a copy of that too. Okay. I'll and as a, as a quick point, if anybody would like to share their email address in the, the chat, you can send that to me as a direct message. I'll make sure you get a copy of the recording and the, and the slides too. Um, I saw Joel, you have your hand up. Yes, I, I got a couple questions. One of the things is if people are having issues, but they have to go outside, is there, you know, we've got N95 masks for COVID, but that seems, uh, that's five microns, I think, or whatever it is, and you say 2.5, so would we need something like an N99 mask or something? Yeah, that's a, a really good question. And N95 masks are uh, effective screens against PM 2.5 pollution. They don't filter all of it, but again, it's kind of bringing that air quality from what would be, you know, hazardous to um, very unhealthy to bringing it down to a level that is more acceptable for you to breathe. The tricky part with the PM 2.5 masks is it does have to be fitted really well. If you have any kind of facial hair, like even just a little bit of facial hair I have is enough that would sort of make the N95 mask really not as effective. So if you have an N95 mask, <laughs> assuring that it's it's uh, fitted well um, will be something that is protective to you. It won't eliminate all of the PM 2.5 uh, particles, but it will uh, bring the level of exposure down, um, which is what you're hoping to do. And then also to do those cloth masks that are helpful um, to prevent the spreading of, of COVID-19 because it sort of catches our spittle when we breathe out. Um, those cloth masks don't offer any protection when it comes to PM 2.5. Okay. What about, um, you have your app that uh, air or fire air now, um, but I used uh, one called from the Oregon Air app. I used that one. And that was pretty nice to have when, they, when it was really bad. Yeah, the um, uh, those uh, the Air Now uh, app from DEQ is one that that will show the same information. So either is is perfectly fine. They'll both show you the same information. The benefit to the fire and smoke map or the Air Now website is it will show those commercial grade purple air monitors which are much more um, spread out across the area, much more common as where we only have eight uh, monitors in Lane County that would show up on DEQ's uh, app that fire.airnow has many more, which includes those purple air sensors. Oh, that's good information. Finally, I mean, I've got one last thing. It's um, when, when we had the smoke incursion, um, I was under the impression that you weren't supposed to run your fan inside, you know, like for your stove and that, because it would bring in, you know, particulates from the outside. I wasn't sure if that was fallacy or real. That that's a tricky question. It depends on how your setup is. Um, some like bathroom fans, for example, and even some of the kitchen fans um, will have a two-way vent where they also will let in outdoor air in. Um, so it, it depends really on the setup that you have. And if you have a set, I'm not sure the best way to check, but if you know that your fan is venting out and not letting anything in, then it's perfectly fine. Um, my general rule of thumb is to just leave it off if you don't know. And um, another question that comes up that's very common is, um, AC units, such as even like the window ones, if you run the AC, because during the summertime and during the wildfire season, it can be really hot. And, and the idea that you can't turn the AC on because um, the smoke is bad. 
that's something you can do because those window AC units don't actually allow airflow to pass through it. It just cools the air and it, it recirculates the indoor air. Um, but I would certainly emphasize um, the importance of making sure that your seal of that AC unit in the window um, is a very good seal because that's more likely where you're going to see any outdoor air come on in. So to check that for any cracks and nooks um, and, and cover them up. Thank you very much for your presentation. I wouldn't run the dryer either because it's pushing air out and that air has to come from somewhere. That's a good point, Fred. Yes, I agree with that. I, I do have a, another question. If you are signed up with the county uh, for on alert sense, which, you know, alerts to because weather things and all kinds of stuff, it, uh, it, do we have to separately uh, do some kind of monitoring or sign up on an El Rapa site, or will you are you included in the alerts that would come from Alert Sense? El Rapa isn't yet tuned into the Alert Sense thing. Um, we're in touch with Devin Ashbrook, who's leading that effort for Lane County and Patience Winningham. Um, and we're not yet, haven't had the training and the access to that. However, we have that communication stream with patients and Devin, that if there was a, a instance where we saw a repeat, like with the holiday farm fire, um, the alert sense would be utilized in that way. Uh, but when it comes to more smaller changes in air quality, whether it's from good to even the unhealthy for sensitive groups, that's something that ha happens frequently enough in our area um, that there wouldn't be any kind of alert sense notification through that because it would kind of become a boy who cried wolf. Not that it would be wolf in the sense that the air quality wouldn't be bad, but it would be common enough that I think people would maybe start to uh, respond less when that alert sense went off. So that's something, a tool that's really helpful, but something to be used sparingly um, for those extreme situations. So the better route is really to just be mindful of the air quality and have the app on your phone or know that website to just check it every so often, especially if you're unsure um, what that air quality is. Okay, thanks. Awesome. Well, this was an awesome presentation. Travis, thank you so much for coming tonight to talk to us and give us some of that background about what LREPA is up to and how you guys are monitoring things. Yeah, of course. Um, thanks for inviting me. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, you know, share this information, particularly this time of year with wildfire season coming up. Um, I will, since this has come up a couple times uh, this evening, I'll just put a link into where you can submit an air quality complaint if you're being impacted, whether it's from a wood stove or whether it's from an outdoor burn, or if you smell an odor that's kind of strange or weird. Um, we appreciate learning about those things because what it does is it sort of alerts us to, to look into it, to see what may be creating the problem, um, hopefully to identify it and then uh, take action to resolve the problem. There are instances where we can't determine the source of an odor or be able to determine where the smoke is coming from. Um, um, but uh, not knowing that it's even occurring to begin with is the worst. So uh, letting us know when you experience something is something we always appreciate. All right. Thank you, everybody. I think that concludes our presentation tonight. This meeting recording will be uploaded to YouTube and we'll send out the links um, via meeting via email. And if we have other questions, Travis, we will reach out to you if anything else comes up. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming tonight. Thank, Thank you. you.